I actually have enjoyed everything I've done, even if it hasn't necessarily gone my way or it hasn't been something that I've enjoyed enormously doing. Actually, th there's, there's been stuff which I've taken out of it which I can, I can be thankful for because of who I am today. Prepare your ears, humans. Happy, sad, confused begins now. Today on Happy, Sad, Confused, I'm Josh Horowitz, and it's a Happy, Sad, Confused flashback episode with Henry Cavill. Hey guys, as I said, I'm Josh Horowitz, and welcome to another edition of Happy, Sad, Confused. Well, with The Witcher coming back for the final season with our beloved Henry Cavill, I thought I would dig up a oldie but a goodie. This is a 2020 conversation with the one and only Mr. Henry Cavill. Uh, it's a great chat that was done during the pandemic, during those crazy times. Um, but it was one of our better geek out sessions, I will say, that we've ever had. Uh, we talked a lot about Enola Holmes at the time, a lot about The Witcher, about Justice League at the time, Zack Snyder, and a lot about Lord of the Rings. Um, this was his comfort movie choice. So it was a real fun opportunity to geek out on what makes Henry Cavill tick. And we know he's a born and bred geek like myself, like many of you. So I know you guys are going to enjoy this vintage episode of Happy, Sad, Confused. Before we get into that, I want to remind you folks, uh, remember to like, subscribe, spread the good word. Um, that's how this podcast grows and grows and grows. And I thank you in advance for that. Hit that like and subscribe button and um, join the fun of Happy, Sad, Confused. Um, as I said, a lot's transpired for Henry in the last few years. Look, the ups and downs of Witcher and Superman and all of it, but um, I have the utmost confidence this man is going to rise and rise and rise. He's one of uh, the most... Um, I, I, how do I describe Henry? He is the um, most courteous, kindest, uh, conscientious, just a gentleman through and through, and it is all um, in the he-man body <laughs> that he has cultivated, and yet inside, like I said, he has that, that inner geek soul that we can talk about video games and Lord of the Rings and superheroes, and he just l lives and reads that stuff. So um, he's one of my favorites. I know he's many of your uh, favorites as well. So if you've never checked out this conversation, I think you're really going to dig it. Um, there's no video on this if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, we didn't record video at the time. So um, you're going to be able to watch it as it were, but you're going to be able really listening to the conversation. Uh, and if obviously, if you're listening to this podcast, um, you conjure up the images of the beautiful Henry Cavill in your mind, and that will do all the work for you. Okay, uh, without any further ado, let me toss back to myself, September of 2020, me and the one and only Henry Cavill. Uh, it's good to see you, buddy. How you doing? It's good to see you, too. I am very well. Very well, thanks. Um, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. Like, it's, it's I feel like I haven't seen you in ages and and we've known each other for so long and now is the only the first time i'm in your house what's going on with that well <laughs> i was gonna say welcome to my apartment in new york um yeah this is this is as close as i wanted you into the apartment i don't trust you quite yet we've known each other a while henry but i don't know if we're in the stage to welcome physically into each other's homes what do you think frankly i'm i'm wounded <laughs> don't be um it has you've been a been, while you've been there for some of the formative moments of my life when i can't come into your apartment what? <laughs> I take it back. I take it back. You are always welcome, my friend. Um, but I was going to say, I mean, yeah, I was doing the math when I knew I was going to chat with you today. We're about to celebrate our 10-year anniversary, Henry. Um, oh, my goodness. Insanity. We, we, need to, um, we need to get some kind of cake going, some champagne or something. Yeah. I feel like I'm going to be the one that eats all the cake, and you're just going to stare at me. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. I, I, will, I, will, I will stare at you if you eat all the cake because I'll be pissed off because I, I will eat all the cake first. In fact, we can have two cakes. What kind of cake do you like? What kind of cake don't I like? Um, I, I'm a frosting guy. I'll do red velvet. Yeah, I can, I can okay. do that. What's your, what's your cake right. of choice? Um, I, I like red velvet and anything, anything salted caramel, really. So even like a salted caramel cheesecake, like I'm into that. I'm glad that they prepped you to know that this was a 40 minute conversation about our favorite cakes. So this is just the yeah. beginning. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've, I've got, I've got, I've got cake stories. <laughs> <laughs> I know that about you, but in, in relative seriousness, um, even in these crazy times, it's, I'm, I'm excited that I have the opportunity to catch up with you. I've always enjoyed chatting with you over the years and um, congratulations on the new films this is a delight. Enola Holmes is a super sweet and fun movie. Um, 
But I, but I am curious, like looking back, like because we have had a bit of a history, 10 years ago, if I talked to you on the, and that was right when you were cast as Superman, this was a momentous moment in your career. What do you think about the 10 years that have transpired career-wise? Like at that time, did you set goals for yourself? You knew Superman was going to be a hell of an opportunity. And I'm sure as an actor, you wanted to make the most of that specific, specific opportunity, but also what that would lead to. Um, let's analyze for a second. The last 10 years, what do you think? I mean, I, I didn't set goals for myself. And, and I'm glad I didn't because, I mean, under normal circumstances, uh, I would say it's always good to set goals. But I'm glad I didn't because there have been all sorts of curveballs and, and weird U-turns and lefts and right where I weren't expecting them, zigged when I should have zagged, and everyone else zagged when, I, when they should have zigged. And it just, it's been full of surprises. It's been full of, full of uh, things changing, which I wasn't expecting. And I certainly wouldn't have expected 10 years ago when we were first having those conversations. And I'm, I'm happy. Oh, obviously, there are some things which I, I wish would have happened differently over the past 10 years. But I'm really happy they have happened that way because lockdown taught me a lot. Let's put it that way. Lockdown taught me a lot about uh, appreciation of everything that we have. Uh, life is um, surprisingly short sometimes. And it's all about taking everything for what it's worth which is if you can't take a positive out of it, then, then you shouldn't be doing it. And I actually have enjoyed everything I've done, even if it hasn't necessarily gone my way or it hasn't been something that I've enjoyed enormously doing. Actually, th there's, there's been stuff which I've taken out of it, which I can, I can be thankful for because of who I am today. Right. And it's led to things like this. It's led to things like The Witcher. It's led to things like having the opportunity to work with Millie Bobby Brown and Harry Bradbury. And so actually the past 10 years, despite having their ups and downs and ebbs and flows and not necessarily having gone the way which I wanted it to go in some scenarios, I'm very, very thankful for and very happy for. Well, and I'm sure there's a recognition and you probably knew it back then, but you know it more so now than ever that there's only so much you can control as an actor in this business. Yeah. You can control what you deliver and what you deliver each day on set and give it 110%. And there, there's just a myriad of other factors involved. And, um, and yeah, if, if you don't take something out of, out of every experience, good or bad, what are, you, what are you in this for? And I know that's partially why, why I find it you know, admirable, for instance, like The Witcher you went after. Like, you know, I, I don't think of like an actor like you who's like accomplished a lot as someone that's chasing roles, but you were still like, <laughs> no, that's, that's worth like putting myself on tape for doing whatever I have to do because I yeah. know that's something that I will be passionate about and I can, I can, that can bring me to another level. Absolutely. And it's not even about the other level. It's about, it's about doing the thing you want to do. And yeah. again, referencing lockdown, thinking about things I want to do in the future. And I, I love fantasy and sci-fi. Those are the books I read. And so it's the kind of stuff which I want to do and it's made me it's made me be a lot more proactive and start chasing after stuff and saying, well, hey, you know what? Don't wait for someone else to make the movie. Go after it yourself. See what yep. you can do and yep. start putting a team together, like really work on that. And I'm excited because now, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a passion pursuit because some things are out of my control, absolutely out of my control. And it's all, about, it's all about patience with some things and it's all about proactive action with, with others. And so... And so, yeah, it, lockdowns taught me a lot, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to doing things that I love doing every day. You know. So I I, I definitely want to hit upon um, the love of fantasy, where as you know, we're we're talking about comfort movies in part on the podcast lately. But I, I do want to ask a couple couple things about this new movie of yours because honestly, I I really dug it. Enola Holmes, as I said, uh, a sweet sort of a different take on uh, some familiar characters. Um, you're no stranger to iconic roles. Clearly, you don't shy away from these challenges. Um, Sherlock presents some interesting challenges in and of itself, though. I mean, not only is he as, as one of the most recognizable characters in the history of, of literature, but we have some very good recent examples of takes on Sherlock. We don't have to go that far back to see some really cool, interesting takes. So yeah. what makes this worth doing? Is it the fact that it is a bit of a different take on the character than what Benedict's done, what, what Downey's done? I, I, I don't know if it was the different take on the character that, that necessarily, necessarily drew me to it. 
it was the story itself. It was the messaging in the story. It was, uh, it was the way that Sherlock is utilized in this story to affect the new generation via Enola Holmes. And I loved that. I loved it. I, I'm, I'm not going to try and compare myself to these fantastic performances of Sherlock Holmes that have come before. And I think if you did, then it would drive you crazy uh, because it has been done in so many different ways and, and marvelously so. And so for me, it was, it was just looking at it and feeling something when I read the script and going, yeah, this feels really good. And I love what it's trying to tell people. I love what it's saying. And then obviously Millie Bobby Brown and Harry Bradbeer, you think it's, it makes it an easy yes. It makes it, it makes it, you know, a no brainer. This, this character is, you know, famously maybe the most intelligent man on the face of the earth. You've played, you know, our mo most iconic, virtuistic, you know, hu uh, superhero on the planet. Do you ever just want to play like a dumb, stupid guy that has no good attributes? Because you're setting yourself up for failure, my friend. You meet somebody <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, you can't possibly compare with all due respect. You're a great guy, but you can't be Sherlock. You can't be Superman. You're a mortal man, Henry. <laughs> That's what I love about these characters. That's what I love about my job. I get to be these incredible characters, which I read in comic books and books and and that's that's what I love about it. I get to I get to exist in the skin of these 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 icons temporarily and briefly and and hopefully a little bit of them rubs off on me in the process. Right. And and that is the blessing of doing what I do. And that's that's what I dreamed of as a kid and, and I'm very, very lucky to be here doing it. Were you uh I love Mr. Sam Claflin. I go way back with that gentleman as well. I could see you two get, get, getting along well. Uh, did you guys cross paths in the audition circuit? Did you know each other before this project? Um, we, I think we had, we had met a couple of times very briefly, uh, but we hadn't really crossed paths. Uh, we actually, we, we've auditioned for a bunch of the same stuff. And yeah, I think we met at a couple of BAFTA parties. But uh, yeah, it just just respect for the man, absolute respect for Sam, and and he's he's very funny. He had me laughing really really hard. Uh, it was actually at some points <laughs> it was a little difficult to keep it straight and keep it serious and professional because once he had once he had me tickled like Offset, then as soon as we were on and action was happening, I was like just just forget just forget the thing he just did because it's going to kill your performance. <laughs> we're not talking actual literal tickling. He's not like literally going. No, no, he's, he's not literally taking me, tickling me. <laughs> that would have been, that would have been <laughs> too far. <laughs> I mean, ah, you never know. You never know. <laughs> a little bit of affection. We're missing it now, aren't we? <laughs> we are. Now we could use a little tickle. <laughs> yeah. Sam Claflin, where are you? Um, <laughs> you've got the wonderful Millie Bobby Brown at the center of this. Uh, must have been all of 15 or 16 years old when she shot this film. Uh, yep. Take me back to Henry Cavill at 15 or 16. Would you have had the wherewithal to be the actor and virtual icon that Millie is right now? You know what? I, I would love to say yes, but no, I don't <laughs> think so. I don't think so. It's uh, Millie is extraordinary and unique. When I first met her, uh, the initial thought was, I was like, oh no, this human being isn't getting to experience childhood because they're so mature. They're, they're so different from every other teenager I've met. And I just thought, oh, that's such a shame. And then two seconds later, I was like, oh no, no, she's still a teenager. It's, <laughs> she does this amazing flip-flop between the two where she's an incredibly mature person who, who speaks, speaks like they're 35 years old, who talks right. about characters, talks about performances, talks about directors or storytelling or whatever it may be. And then she starts talking to you about Love Island and, and trying to get you to do <laughs> TikTok dances. And, and it's, uh, it's just, she's such a marvelous person to be around. The energy coming off her is yeah. infectious. And uh, I'm, she's, she's gonna have a massive impact on this industry. I'm just happy to be a part of her story. I was going to say, I mean, you're pretty good on social media. Millie, though, I mean, this is, this is like what she was born to do, right? She's like the queen of social media. So did she, yeah. I assume you're not working on TikTok now. Has she, has she taught you any moves in, in the social media space? No, I, I'm, um, I don't want to encroach upon, you know, <laughs> Millie's space. I, I don't want to cramp her style. I don't right. want to make her look bad. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm leaving the TikTok to her. Yeah, you let her do the dances. You'll make your computers in the barn. You each got exactly. your skill set. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs>
there is nothing I hate more than wasting money. That's why I'm so thrilled about our sponsor this week on Happy Sack Infused. It's Rocket Money. How often have you bought into that try it free for 30 days guarantee, right? That's just enough time to try it. And then of course you completely forget about it. It's happened to me, it's happened to you. Over 80% of people have subscriptions they forget about. Rocket Money is there for you. It's a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Rocket Money will quickly and easily find your subscriptions for you. And for any you don't want to pay for anymore, you just hit cancel and Rocket Money will cancel it for you. It's that easy. It also helps you manage all your finances in one place and automatically categorize your expenses. So you can easily track your budget in real time and also get alerted if anything looks off. Over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, saving the average person, get this, up to $720 a year. So stop throwing your money away, cancel unwanted subscriptions, and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash HSC. That's rocketmoney.com slash HSC. Rocketmoney.com slash HSC. So you mentioned how you were at a different place when you were her age. Uh, from, all, from our past conversations and stuff I've heard you say, you were, I mean, I don't know, you describe it yourself. How were you as a, as a teenager? You felt a bit like on the outside looking in. You didn't feel like you had a place. Where, where were you at when you were a teenager? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I've been thinking about that a lot recently, obviously. Uh, I think I was probably um, a very openly emotional kid. I wore my heart on my sleeve. Uh, that was for whatever reason where where my personality landed amongst the personality of the five boys in my family. And, and, uh, yeah, I was just, I think, uh, it's, it's interesting because boarding school was tough for me, uh, because I was so openly emotional. I think, uh, there's something about that where you do make yourself a target. And if it hadn't been for my mum being such a, a, a tough, strong person, then, then perhaps it could have crushed me being that open. Uh, but instead, it didn't crush me. It just prepared me and it helped me be more uh, understanding of an industry that says no a lot and, right. and more resilient to it. It's just, it's just one of those things. Uh, I, I, I don't mind if people say no now. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so used to it and uh, rejection is, is, is okay. It's just one of those things that happens. And so I think as a kid, yeah, I was very openly emotional and uh, I, I'm glad I was because that helps with the acting. It does. Are, are the legends of quote unquote fat cavil true? Were you really <laughs> called that as a kid? Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, I was absolutely. And I was, I was a chubby kid. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a, it was a fitting nickname. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can fault them for many things but accuracy they had accuracy on their side <laughs> yeah no, they, they hit the nail on the head right there i was like my name is cavill and i am fat so pfft, can't argue with that that's, that's some pretty sound logic <laughs> and, uh, around what age are we talking here when that um i would say longer. probably 13 14 15 16 maybe towards 17 i started leaning out a little bit right. but only in the face as i started to kind of stretch out and grow but uh, I, I was definitely still porky. I remember when I first got, <laughs> when I first got the Count of Monte Cristo, uh, the producers called my mum and they said, so uh, could Henry lose about 14 pounds? And I mean, if, if they're saying that to, you know, a, a kid at the age of, I was, I was 17 at the time, Wow. then and that's 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 a, like a that's a large percentage of your body weight at 17 yeah. Yeah. Um, unless of course you're one of these you know sporting uh, icons who somehow weigh 240 pounds at 17 and you work you know you're about to play for kansas city chiefs or something right then uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> but yeah i was i was definitely a, an overweight kid and and that's you know that's fine that is what it is i think uh, health yeah. is really really important i'm really glad that in today's world, we have a better handle on it. There's better access to, to health tips and diets and stuff. And one of the good things about some of the pressures of social media is that it does inspire you to be fitter and to get in great shape. Right. Because even if it's all lies, at least it's a goal <laughs> to work towards. <laughs> and 
you know, I, I, I would have, uh, maybe it would have affected me. Maybe it wouldn't. I mean, I'm looking yeah. at my nephews who are about the same age now and, and their interaction with social media. And thank God that my, my brother and my sister-in-law are such fantastic parents because those are two really well-rounded young individuals. And, uh, you know, uh, God, who knows? Who knows? You, you can't really put today, yourself definitely. in their shoes. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about um, forming your tastes as a kid. Um, I, you said that fantasy was a big part of your life growing up. Um, who helped inform your, your movie or television tastes? Was it one of your brothers? Was it friends? Who was the biggest influence on the, on the films and TVs that you, the TV that you gravitated towards? I think it's got to be my dad. Absolutely. My dad still reads all the same books that I read. Um, he got me into PC gaming. It's, he got me into the type of PC games I play. And... <laughs> Yeah, do you play against them still? Um, I used to a bit. I haven't done actually. I don't really get to play with my brothers at all anymore. Um, none of us have the time. You know, we're all too yeah. too busy adulting, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and maybe that's maybe that's something we should make more, more time for uh, because it would be nice to interact with each other a lot more. But yeah, it was my dad. My dad informed a lot of my my tastes in in books, movies, and computer games. Um, I saw your conversation recently in lockdown with the great Patrick Stewart. Uh, you seem to be beaming in that. I felt a little bit of like kind of geeking out on your part. Were you, is that just because he's a legend or were you in particular, like, did you grow up watching Next Generation? Were you a Star Trek guy at all? Yeah, I grew up watching Next Generation and uh, I grew up watching that with my brothers and my dad. And so that is the only actor ever, uh, or only person in the industry ever who, when I found out I'm going to be interacting with him, I've then immediately text the group chat and gone, guys, guess what? I'm going to be talking to Sir Patrick Stewart. It's nuts. And <laughs> what is and this like? How did this happen? They're like, oh my yeah. God, that's cool. Make sure you ask him about this and don't ask him about that because we watched all his interviews. And, <laughs> and it's just, yeah, he's, he's not only a legend, but Sir Patrick is, is a very kind, giving man. And yeah. It was a real pleasure talking to him. I, I, I'm gutted that it was during this pandemic, so I didn't actually get to see him in person. Uh, but hopefully one day he and I can share a glass of wine or something and uh, have a good old chat. It'd yeah, be it's, nice. tr it's tricky talking to those folks, as you well know, that are so associated with these roles or franchises that you, you love, because and you know this better than anybody, They're, these are complicated relationships with characters you're so well associated with. Like I've had Patrick on the podcast a couple of times and the first time I was a little scared to go too deep into Star Trek. And that was one of like the gifts of like, I had him on like right before lockdown and he was promoting Picard and I'm like, oh my God, yeah. I can actually ask him all the geeky Star Trek questions now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is my chance. <laughs> this is it. Best of yeah. both worlds part two. I have a follow-up question. Um, yeah. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so was it, fantasy books and tv and film or was it mostly literature at first like what was the what was, what was tell me your like fantasy like uh influences as a kid it was it was all of them i mean but my earliest experiences of fantasy was was my dad reading to me i have this very vivid memory of lying in bed at a house called Le Clues in jersey and um my dad was reading me a, a, a series of short stories and i yeah, it was, I think it's, it was reading him reading to me. And yeah. then, and then me when, once I got into reading myself, picking up books and finding, finding stories that I loved. And I just, the, the stories contained within these amazing worlds are, are so relevant to us. And that's what I think is, I really connect with. It's yeah, fun, fantasy, adventure, crazy, crazy stuff happens and dragons and shit like that. But <laughs> also amazing moral codes yep. and and le lessons on on how to be and you see these heroes of yours who stumble and fall and get up again and you learn that lesson through them and somehow you want them to respect you even though they don't exist and so you try and emulate them and it's i think stuff like that uh is is really important and it's definitely formative to who i am Everything you describe describes the uh, not one but three films you technically chose as your comfort movie uh, yeah, yeah. today, and not only three films but expanded versions of three films. I didn't have a chance yeah. since I just got them yesterday to revisit them again. Though of course these are movies that are close to my heart as well. But Henry, tell us what your comfort film films are and and why you chose them. 
Okay, Comfort Films, uh, Lord of the Rings Extended Edition. Uh, I chose them because that's one of those, it's okay. I think when, whenever I've been hanging out with people, whether it be previous girlfriends or whether it be friends and we're all saying, well, what are we going to do? Or, uh, you know, what do you want to do for Christmas? Or it's, it's, you're all cozy inside and, you know, the rain is blowing sideways outside in London and the house is nice and warm and you've just ordered, you know, Chinese takeaway and like, what should we do? Or a pizza or something. You go, let's watch, you check your watch. Let's watch Lord of the Rings extended edition. <laughs> and, and then you, you just get into it. And it's such a, even though you've watched the story a hundred times, it's so well done. It's, it's, you can watch the extended edition, which is, I mean, what are they? Something silly like three and a half to four hours each. Yeah, pretty much. I've got them here somewhere, but yeah. These are yeah. long movies. Yeah, 30 more minutes in Fellowship, 44 extra minutes in Two Towers, 51 extra minutes in Return of the I mean, Kings. It is a massive, massive movie experience. And, and I love them. I love it. It's just so well put together, every single aspect of it. And you don't feel like you're watching, you know, someone who's just walked out of a costume shop. They look like real characters. Yeah. And I mean, just Andy Serkis playing Gollum. It, it, people still think they do flawless impressions of Gollum and they don't, but <laughs> everyone's trying to do it. And I, I just absolutely, I, I love those movies and, and the way you can just cozy up and watch them with anyone. And even yeah. people who aren't into fantasy are like, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm into it. They, they are, as you say, they're, they're immersive experiences. They are, you can really lose yourself in that world, whether you've read the Tolkien books or not. Um, they, the, so many of the qualities you mentioned, I admire in them, not to mention the great ensemble of acting that's in it, the impeccable direction by Peter Jackson. The, these, the, these were game changers of films. Obviously, Star Wars changed the landscape for, for fantasy sci-fi, but, but even Star Wars didn't win Best Picture, and Return of the King won Best Picture, and it kind of legitimized right. the fantasy genre, and we're still yeah. seeing it all these years later. I mean, there's probably not Game of Thrones there's probably not Witcher, frankly, if there's not Lord Absolutely. of the Rings. Um, talk to me about where you were at in your life when you first saw Fellowship. You must have been probably 17 or 18 by my math. So oh, I assume by then yeah. you'd read the Tolkien books. And was that, a, was that a big moment to see this vision realized on the big screen? Believe it or not, I have not read the Tolkien books. Wow. Don't yeah. worry. You're, uh, we're in it together, buddy. We're two geeks no, that I, somehow I, I, it missed it. Yeah, I, me, me too. It's, it, it's one of those things where... I think uh, I have memories of listening to the audiobooks, and those are the only audiobooks I've ever listened to when it comes to uh, fiction, fantasy, and sci-fi and stuff. Uh, in the car on the way to boarding school, I remember putting those on and the wonderful performances in there. And then when the movies came out, watching the movies, and I didn't look at them and think, meh, that's a performance, or I didn't like that, or that doesn't look real. I believed it. And that was the beautiful part of it. And uh, I mean, it's, as you say, just so well crafted. And especially for someone who loved fantasy, it was just a reinforcement for my belief in, in that world and, and what fantasy can do and what it can represent. Did the timing ever work out in your career at, when they were auditioning for either Lord of the Rings initially or The Hobbit? Have you ever been up for one of these Peter Jackson Middle Earth adventures? Uh, no, I haven't. I have not. I'm trying to think. That was um, Orlando Bloom's first movie, wasn't it? I think so. If not one of his first, yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I think I went up for Pirates. Oh, okay. Uh, but I never went up for Lord of the Rings. That I remember. Or not, or not knowingly anyway. It could be one of those things where, you know, they say, oh, yeah, read this thing. And I just didn't right. know what was happening. <laughs> um... um but yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I, I never went up for one knowingly anyway. And it, um, I'm kind of glad, I'm kind of glad. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I just got, got to have to the enjoy it as, yeah, totally. Yeah. I think one of the things that people also ex uh, enjoy in retrospect about that trilogy is how fully fleshed out it is from beginning to end. Peter Jackson had a vision, obviously the blueprint was there in the books, but he, they shot it all simultaneously. He did a lot of like additional shooting as it went, but he knew from the get-go, this was going to be two or three films. He knew the beginning, middle, and, and end of this story. And yeah. frankly, there's been a lot of like 
debate about this in like, you know, film geek community in recent years, Star Wars, the recent trilogy of Star Wars. I'm sure you've seen those films. Um, you know, a lot of yeah. fans are like, oh, why didn't they have the trilogy mapped out from the start? And I think it, there are advantages and disadvantages. There are different approaches. Um, do you engage with that? I mean, I feel like I, I know you, you, you follow all this stuff to a degree. Do you have a take on that? I mean, even, even applying it to your own work, like I think that's something that people really admire about what Zach did in he, your collaborations with him and what people were so excited by by Justice League was he had a plan. He, ha he was opening up and expanding the universe with all these Easter eggs for future films to come. Um, yeah. Fair to say, I mean, is that something that you, you relate to your own experience at all? I mean, I, the idea of, the idea of uh, a grand plan and, and executing on that, is that something, is that is the question? Yeah, I guess so, yeah. It's, I'm a details guy, right? Yeah. And bear with me. I'm a details guy. I'm a law loyalist. And so when it comes to adaptations and stuff, it's, it's important to me that things are faithful, uh, faithful to adaptations and, and faith, sorry, faithful to the source material. Yeah. And when you are just a carriage on someone else's train, it can be a dangerous place to be in when you are the train itself, when you are the Peter Jackson, when you are the Zack Snyder, when you are the Dennis Villeneuve, it is, I'm sure, absolutely amazing uh, because it's your vision and it's, it's your version and you get to do, whether it's a, an adaptation of the source material, which you really want to see, or whether it's like so, so beautifully faithful to the source material that you get to mention every single little detail and that has to be just this way and that has to be this way and no we're not cutting that character and and no that character won't do that they'll do it exactly as they do in the book then that's fantastic too but the scary thing is when you're someone who's so into details and an almost psychopathic law loyalist like i am especially when it comes to fantasy and sci-fi then then it can be it can be a a double-edged sword being yeah. just a carriage on the train and so it's, it's one of those things. It's, um, it's, I suppose it does keep it interesting to say the very least. Zach will always come up in your career in these discussions. And I, and I feel like it, it, it happens, it happens in my um, discussions, discussions with Momoa too. I mean, you guys, you know, he really, kickstarted your career to another level. I feel like there will always be a loyalty and a simpatico for many reasons for what Zack Snyder did for you. Um, what, do you what did you learn from your experiences with Zack? What, what do you admire about what Zack Snyder brings to filmmaking, his approach, his attention to detail? What do you take away? It's Zack's attention to detail. Uh, Zack's, Zack's visual talent is extraordinary. And the way he tells stories, you see it through the visual. He's, he's such an exceptional crafter of moments. And, and uh, love him or hate him, uh, everyone talks about the movies that he makes. Yeah. And so it's, it's, I've learned a lot from, from his version of storytelling in the sense that he, he relies on those moments very, very much. And he's very much the, the visual medium. And he's, he's so good at it. Zach's visuals are, are second to none, man. And, and it's, it's something which I'm going to take with me. And absolutely. And I do take with me when I dream of, of doing my own fantasy saga, like movies or, or TV shows, it's, the visuals are a major aspect of it. And I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of that is, is down to experiencing what Zach crafts. Yeah, and, he sets the yeah, bar very, very high yeah. for any aspiring filmmaker, anyone that wants to create a world. I mean, he, those first, I, I, I always think back to those like first like 10 minutes of Man of Steel and it's just like, what the fuck am I in? This is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I don't want you to get you into trouble with like Snyder cut discussion. Every, every word is parsed out like insanity, but yeah. I, I, <laughs> as his eyes go wide, I can see it. You guys can't see it, but his eyes went wide. <laughs> I know it, but I'm just curious. I mean, we're, it sounds like we're going to see like four hours of this. It's going to be a four part series and that he's going to then put it all together. Like in, in your recollection, did you shoot a four hour movie with Zach? Was there, was there that much movie 
in what you initially well, shot I mean, with him? I mean, I didn't because we know what happened to my character. That's fair. And... That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> was the script you saw a 250 page script though? <sighs> was it? I mean, it's so long ago now. <laughs> Um, I've made five movies since then, Josh. Come on. I mean, yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, it's everything that he shot is what he's using, and I mean, yeah. of course, there's there's certain things you can add because, uh, I mean, let's talk about uh, the the opening of the movie with the invasion of Earth and and the gods defending Earth, etc. Yeah. Okay. That's all CGI, apart from a few characters, and so there's there's stuff there which you you can build in post. You can spend, you know, six hundred million dollars on on making CGI stuff. Sure. And so, and so, uh, yes, uh, I would say there is definitely a four and a half hour movie there. It's it's in the can, plus the stuff which they're going to craft in post now. And so, uh, I mean, I'm I'm just really excited to see see his vision realized. I think, yep. it, as we were talking about earlier, it's he he got to be the train, and and. I think it's only fair that, that train gets to reach its station, which it was aiming for. Uh, I think it's important that that vision is realized. Whether you agree with it or not, it doesn't matter. It's a, it's a, it's a storyteller's, it's a filmmaker's right to have that vision realized. And, and I'm excited to see it. I'm excited to see what that vision was and, and how it looks. And especially, he's got the advantage of hindsight now, and it's gonna be even better. I, I just want, I wanna see a good movie. Or series cool. of movies. <laughs> <laughs> and you're cool with growing the mustache back, obviously, so that they can just digitally oh, move yeah, it Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to grow the mustache back just for the just for that event, and then I'm just going to, you know, put like a a little uh, band aid over it to hide it. <laughs> that's that's pretty much what they did the first time around. So why not? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all saw it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, are you are you back shooting Witcher now? Are you in the thick of it? Uh, yes, I'm actually at. Arborfield Studios right now. I don't know if it sounds like I'm in a cathedral to you, but uh, it's I'm I'm in one of the um, one of the studio buildings, and they're shooting just over yonder. I just assumed your home was a was a scary black box um, that uh, just had no well, furniture. Well, actually, ironically <laughs> enough, it's, it's only black on the back. The rest of it looks like a super budget Fortress of Solitude around me. Oh, it's no. all white polystyrene walls. I wish we could turn the camera around. Oh well. <laughs> yeah. So, so second season for this, and as, as I alluded to early in our conversation, this was a property that meant a lot to you. Something you chased. Uh, must be so gratifying that the audience responded, and you get a second crack at it to, to continue this character. Um, what are the lessons learned for you from the first slew of episodes that you're applying to this next batch? Um, what are the lessons I've learned? Or is it simply just an opportunity? Like obviously the advantage of an ongoing story is fleshing out the world, fleshing out the character more time to let it breathe. I mean, yes. I mean, again, I, I'm, 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 I'm a carriage in on, on this train and it's about, it's about finding my character's place within the overall vision of the showrunner. The showrunner has a particular vision for the show and, and for the characters in the show. And as you, I mean, I don't know if you've read the books, but the books, uh, certainly the first few, there's very much from a Geralt perspective. And so with the shift of the showrunner's vision where it's, it's an ensemble cast more so than a singular lead, and and the perspective is is shifted to be almost more of a Cirilla Yennefer perspective, and so it's about finding finding my character's place within within that vision and making sure that that I I do everything I can to be as faithful to the source material as possible that I can be within the structure set out for me. And right. so, I mean, obviously I want to be a loyal soldier and I, I'm, I want to make sure the train keeps on running. I'm not going to derail the whole thing. It's, it's about making sure I play my part in it, but also um, maintaining my, my love and belief for the fantasy and, and the books and indeed the games because a big gamer and, and that, the, the stuff which CD Projekt Red did, absolutely stunning. And they set the bar super high for when it comes to everything Witcher. And so, yeah, it's, it's about being, it's about uh, finding, finding that place in there where I can, I can do both. I can help the showrunner realize their vision 
and yeah. also also bring everything I can from the books and from that that psychopathic like law loyalist nature of mine into my own personal character. It, it seems we're in a cool spot um, where technology has caught up and, and and appetite has caught up to these fantasy video game genre properties where there are uh, opportunities to spend the money required and to attach the the right talent the right actors like yourself and the right creative visionaries to projects that are worthwhile 20 years ago you know when we were growing up it was few and far between it was like until like you know brian singer did x-men and stuff like that it was like yeah. then finally there was the shift um this is a conversation we've had a lot over the years with me and other actors and yourself, like video games have had a tough time getting the proper adaptations. Is there yeah. another game that as a gamer that you are like, why have they not exploited that? Why have they not turned that into a great film or TV property? Does anything come to mind? Elder Scrolls. Elder Scrolls, Skyrim, Morrowind. It's that there's so much that they've built such a universe there. Uh, but that's a tricky one. That's a really tricky one because I think some of the mistakes of movies, uh, which are adaptations from video games, are that they try and do the video game as a movie and that doesn't work because you, I mean, especially when it comes to something like Elder Scrolls, for example. But you just talked about yourself as the loyalist, as the guy that needs, to, needs, needs it all to be accurate. Absolutely, but, but it can be universe accurate. But I see. If you can't do the Elder Scrolls as a movie and give the user the same experience, because right. the thing about Elder Scrolls is the sandbox environment. You can do whatever you want. You start off as this character, which is a blank sheet, and you can go in whichever way you want. And you can even change direction halfway through and go back and do something else. Right. And you, you, you know, instead of being the, you know, <laughs> the emperor's guard or something, you end up being the most preeminent assassin in the land. You kill the emperor. And it's you can't give the viewer that same experience. But what right. you can do is you can be a loyalist to, to the universe and the world that, and the rules which exist within that world. But yeah. you have yep. to pick a story. And that's where the trick or the tricky bit is for adaptations. If I were to ever adapt Elder Scrolls, it's going to be really difficult to please everyone. Um, you do something like Skyrim, how do you play the character? Like which, which story do you take? Which story do you tell? And that's where the difficulties lie because the gamer, the gamer gets to choose. And when you take that choice away, there's immediate resentment. <laughs> yeah, it, it requires a, a certitude of vision, someone that you trust behind the, uh, behind the camera or, 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 or writing it. And someone with a confidence, again, you know, the Zack Snyder's of the world, who, good, or, good or bad, someone that knows what they want and will stick to that Abs vision. Absolutely. If, if, if someone said, okay, you know what? James Cameron is gonna make a Skyrim movie. Everyone's right. on board. They're yeah. like, it's fine, it's cool. James yep. Cameron knows better than I know. It's cool, <laughs> yeah. It's like, I wouldn't have done that, but it's James Cameron, it's great. Yeah. And it's, that's the thing, you've got to trust you got to trust the filmmaker. You got to trust the person at the helm, and that I think makes it easier for even the most resentful of gamer to be like, "Well, I wouldn't have done it that way, but you know what? It's pretty good." <laughs> as we as we wrap up, I'm just curious. We obviously don't know the future, the future of Superman. That those are rumors every day. I'm not going to pick your brain on that. But just as somebody that's been a part of that universe and is also a fan of that universe. Are you excited about the new films that are coming? I mean, we obviously have Wonder Woman coming. We have an Aquaman sequel that's going to come. The Flash movie sounds so cool in that it's opening up this multiverse. I mean, Michael Keaton, Batman coming back? Come on, <laughs> Henry. Does that make your brain explode know, as much as mine? Yeah, that, that's, that's going to be crazy. It's, yes, I am. I'm really excited. I want to see, see which direction they're going in. Uh, I want to see where they're taking it. I want to see... I want to see Gal's Wonder Woman again. I want to see. I want to see Jason be Aquaman again. I want to see where these stories develop to. It's it's exciting. It's exciting to see what they want to do, and I I love these superhero characters. Obviously, I do, yeah. and especially the DC universe. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, and I want to see how audiences react. I want to see how people what they like, what they don't like. Because that to me is fascinating as, as someone who, who wants to be a producer as well and maybe even one day direct. It's to see how audience react to stuff, especially stuff that I've been a part of and may continue to be a part of. It's, it's like 
to know that, to see how the reaction happens real time and yeah. be an experienced outsider as well, or ex experiencing the thing from the outside as a viewer. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. And uh, I can't wait. I just hope that everything opens up cinema wise and we're all clear of the pandemic. Uh, so things aren't necessarily rated unfairly on, you know, certain circumstances. Like we look at Tenet. I haven't seen Tenet yet, Same, but yeah. Tenet, it's sort of, it, it hasn't done as well as everyone thought as you're doing the box office, but that's because we're at the tail end of a pandemic and everyone's going, well, I'm not going to the cinema. And it's, it was an experiment. It was, and that experiment didn't work for that time. Again, I'm not speaking for the movie. I'm just speaking for the, the cinema. Thing. I, totally I don't think anyone was ready yet. It's, and it's impossible I really times. Yeah. We're, yeah. All these next things that come out that yeah. they're, they're going to be, everyone's going to be ready and people will be going back to the cinema. Thanks, as always, for geeking out with me, my friend. Uh, here's to another 10 years of talking about superheroes and Sherlock Holmes and genre and fantasy and, and just movies in general. And maybe you'll be, maybe in the next 10 years, we'll be talking about your producing and directing career. I wouldn't be surprised. Hey, let's hope. Let's hope. All right. Thanks, man. As always. Thank you very much, my friend. And uh, I hope to see you again soon. And so ends another edition of Happy, Sad, Confused. Remember to review, rate, and subscribe to this show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm a big podcast person. I'm Daisy Ridley, and I definitely wasn't pressured to do this by Josh. <laughs>